Hello everyone. I, Sheikh Said, the student from MGM College of Journalism and Mass Communication, is here with an esteemed personality, Professor Ramin Jaha Begloosar, who is one of the world's leading political philosophers from Iran and the author of 28 books in three languages, including English, French and Farsi. Dr. Ramin received his PhD from Sorbonne University, Paris. He has taught at the Academy of Philosophy in Tehran, been a researcher at the French Institute for Iranian Studies and fellow at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Harvard. He has also taught in the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto and served as head of the Department of Contemporary Studies of the Cultural Research Center in Tehran. Jaha Beglu was the Kotari Chair from 20 December 2005 to 20 May 2007. In 2006, he was arrested and detained in Iran leading to protests worldwide. He was released after four months and rejoined as the Kotari Chair. He is currently Professor and Executive Director of the Mahatma Gandhi Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies and the Vice Dean of the School of Law at O.P. Jindal Global University, Sonipat, India. He is the winner of the Peace Prize from the United Nations Association in Spain in 2009 for his extensive academic work in promoting dialogue between cultures and his advocate for nonviolence. He won the Joseph Lau Ifeber International Essay Prize in 2012. Some of his books include The Spirit of India, The Gandhian Movement, The Decline of Civilization, Why We Need to Return to Gandhi and Tagore 2017, and Letters to Young Philosophers. There's a still a lot left from Sir's life, but keeping it short and simple, let's begin with our interactive session. Well, welcome, sir. Thank you. Hello. Well, we all are curious to know, sir, you started your academic career studying medicine before deciding to become a doctor of the mind. What inspired you? Well, uh, to become a doctor in medicine, I think what uh, inspired me was uh, actually uh, maybe the series that I watched when I was a kid was called Dr. Killer. I wanted to become a Dr. Killer and my cousins actually were uh, doctors and they had studied uh, in uh, in United States. And I think that the most, when I was in high school and I wanted to become a doctor is was to serve humanity and help people. I thought that by being a doctor is not to become rich, is to help people. And uh, I passed a lot of exams when I was in 11th and 12th grades, uh, GCEs and uh, SATs. And finally, I had admissions from Boston University and University of Illinois to start pre-med. So my father asked me, he, since he was also French brought up and uh, he was married to a French woman before my mom, he said, why don't you go to France? And I had uh, a little knowledge of French because I, I was mostly in uh, doing international baccalaureate in high school because since we went around the world with my father who was actually an economist and specialist in oil industry. And uh, I said, okay, you, we, I go to France and, uh, but you know, I, with my visa, uh, we didn't need a visa at the time and for France and Europe, but I, for the United States. So with my American visas, I ended up in Paris. And I started and I did two years of biology, but uh, gradually I think that uh, I was grabbed uh, uh, somehow ontologically and uh, psychologically by this intellectual society of France, which was post-68. And there were a lot of uh, interesting things happening, Good, great philosophers, great feminists, great, everything was interesting. So I started reading and, and learning a lot of French. And, uh, and I decided uh, to not to continue uh, biology and medicine, but to start philosophy. So I took philosophy and I think I was right. I became a, actually a doctor of the soul as Socrates used to say, more than a doctor of uh, body. And uh, I was very happy because I had great, great uh, teachers and um, also my classmates were also very interesting people. So until now I had a great time with philosophy. Well, that's just simply wow, sir. Well, how were you influenced with Gandhian philosophy of nonviolence? Oh, that the story is very long. Again, like any, everything which happened in my life, um, knowledge of India came through my parents. They both had Indian friends when they lived in Iran. 
the Indian ambassador at the time who was from Pune actually, uh, uh, he was a close friend of my parents. Then uh, the artist, uh, Indian artists used to come to the Shiraz festival, cultural festival and art festival. Uh, the great of the great actually. So they used to come to our house after they finished like for example Sonal Man Singh she came and she danced you know in our living room and uh, yeah so I, I got to know a lot of these people and um, so uh, in our house each person had its own library. My mom had her own library and my father had her own, his own library and I had some books also and I read a lot of books. And I discovered actually Gandhi and Tagore in my, and Kumara Swami in my mom's, uh, when I was around 12 years old, in my mother's uh, library. And um, I was interested, I actually saw the picture of Gandhi and I said, oh, I'm going to pick up this book and uh, start reading it a little bit. So I ask, I, I used to ask plenty of questions from my teachers and my parents. Hey, who's this guy? What, what did he do? And so they tried to, they told me the story, a lot of the story. And, uh, and I watched, uh, at the time, as you know, there weren't great movies like Attenborough's movie on Gandhi. I watched Nine, Nine Hours to Rama with Horse by Horse, which is about Gotse. It's not about Gandhi, actually. And which is a very bad movie, of Hollywood movie, but very badly. I mean, it doesn't give you any information about India. It's a very psychologically based uh, about Gotse. And uh, so I watched that, and I was very much influenced. Who is this man who was killed by uh, this man, another man called Gotse? And I started reading, and I was interested. And then when I went to France, while I was doing my studies, I started having Indian friends and getting in touch with people at the UNESCO, especially in the 1980s. And uh, they become so uh, close friends to me that they invited me to the lectures of people coming from India to UNESCO in Paris to give lectures on Nehru, on Gandhi. And, and they asked me uh, at the end of the 1980s, they asked me, well, why don't you travel to India? Uh, you were talking about India, but you haven't discovered India. My parents came because they were invited by Indra Gandhi in 1975. Uh, so they had a good uh, sense of India. But I didn't have a good sense. Uh, so, yeah, so I decided on my own to come to India. And I went to, and uh, my first visit actually, I met, I went to Gandhi Peace Foundation. I met with a lot of Gandhis. I interviewed. Yusha Ben Mehta and Sadiq Ali, who actually were there in, they were in their 90s at the time, and they both uh, were in prison during the emergency, one Muslim, one Hindu, and they were very Gandhian because they worked with Gandhi. So I did the interviews with them, and I published them in French. Okay. That was just working with nonviolent groups in France and taught them a little bit about Gandhi also. Well, moving ahead, talking about your yesterday's speech on the theme of non-violence without borders, you have specially mentioned the term conformist. Yes. Can you please elaborate it for our audience? Well, it doesn't need much elaboration. You just look at our world, how uh, messy is our world, and this has to do with the complacency and conformity, as I said. Well, you know, Conformism is actually a new disease uh, in 21st century, a, a, a social disease, uh, like populism is a social disease right. and political disease. Now, conformism comes, I think, is the backside of the coin of corporatism. You know, people who are arrogant, they don't know anything about human culture, they don't know anything about human civilization, they don't read books, they don't watch classical movies. They don't listen to classical music. So practically, I would say idiots who are governing our world and are governing our academia, and especially very arrogant. So that really, uh, this, is, this is where I get really mad. So because you're dealing with people who want to just what they're thinking there is to have a Mercedes, uh, having a lot of money, but if you start talking about art and civilization with them, they don't know anything. And uh, so the, the first thing which comes to your mind is how do you want to govern our, our world? I mean, economically and politically, because you don't know anything about humanity and you don't know anything about his history of humanity. So conformism, conformism is actually a tendency 
which has been intensified by corporate mindset. And of course, our politicians in today's world, people like Donald Trump and others, if, if they become icons, and everybody wants to become like Donald Trump, I would say this is an idiot with money. Uh, no more than that. And um, 50 years from now, nobody's going to talk about Donald Trump. You know, because once they are dead, they're finished. And nothing is left. But we are still talking about Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, and we're still talking about Gustav Mahler and Beethoven, as even if they were very poor, most of them, and they had a lot of problems. So <clears throat> in the, the problem with conformity is that the art of questioning, the Socratic art of questioning, which I've been writing a great deal about, is stops. And you don't ask questions, you don't self-examine yourself, you don't examine your society, you don't examine the world. And you don't ask questions anymore. So being a conformist is somebody who can very quickly, like Bertolucci's movie actually is called The Conformist, is somebody who becomes a fascist. You know, at the time of Mussolini and Hitler, very quickly people, Germans and Italians, they became fascists. Why? Because they didn't ask questions. There was no self-examination. And uh, another good movie that you can watch is called Good. Uh, it was done, I think, around 20 years ago. And it's about a professor of French literature. He's a specialist of Proust, and he becomes an SS. Again, a conformist. Why? Because there is no self-examination. So I hope this is uh, not going to touch you and your comrades. At least you ask questions about India, about yourself, about the world. Otherwise, you're completely lost, you know? Yes, because, I mean, reading books, of course, is listening to human history, is listening to human consciousness, is listening to what happened uh, uh, in the five, I would say, at least 5,000 years of human civilization from Sumer to today, to 21st century. So <clears throat> one way of doing it, of course, we have the new technologies now. Now we have cinema for the past 100 years. Uh, but I mean, books represented like arts, uh, plastic arts, for example, but painting, sculpture, architecture, they represented, you know, the, all the efforts of humans to make themselves meaningful and uh, to talk about themselves, uh, but also not only about their private sphere, but also about the public sphere. Uh, so if we don't read books, we are cut from uh, the treasures of humanity. You know, I tell my students, my students, my Indian students, they don't read at all. Uh, they don't even read Gandhi and Tagore. That's so the I'm not. We are facing yeah. So I'm so. not. I'm, if if they don't read even Tagore and Gandhi, uh, I'm not expecting them to go and read Borges or uh, you know Mario Vargas Llosa or somebody like or uh, Dante. But unfortunately, they don't read. So that's if, because they don't read, they don't know anything. If I ask them questions, they cannot even open their mouths because they have nothing to say. So the worst thing for a human being is to have nothing to think about and nothing to say. You know, because uh, uh, these are gifts which have been given to us by nature if we don't even uh, believe in a God. Uh, it was given to us by nature. And it was given to us by human civilization. So we are responsible towards what happened before and what's going to happen later on. And we have to make our lives meaningful. So books actually make your uh, life meaningful. And uh, of course, uh, it's, um, books defy you. Because as Borges said, more you buy books, uh, they might throw you out of your apartment mm. uh, or your uh, house because they just uh, pile, up, buy, pile, up, pile up and uh, sometimes if you live with books the books ask you to leave the apartment or the house or the, the room that you're living in <laughs> but again it's fantastic I don't know if you have seen Truffaut's uh, movie which is called uh, Fahrenheit 451 which is based on uh, Ray Bradbury's book it's a great movie it shows about uh, 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 firemen who actually put fire, put fire on books. Uh, they don't extinguish poor fires, they put fire on books. And it's a civilization, which might happen to us, is already there actually, practically is all there. It's a kind of a very totalitarian uh, country or uh, society where people don't read books. Because there's a quote in the movie which says, uh, books make humans unhappy. 
Okay, one of the firemen, the chief fireman says, books make humans unhappy. And he himself, he's very unhappy because he, but he doesn't know that he's unhappy. Why? Because he doesn't ask any questions about his life. Mm -hmm. And as uh, the, the, the books actually, one of the firemen, he becomes a hero of the movie in Truffaut's, uh, or in Bradbury's book and in Truffaut's movie. Why? Because he's so curious, he starts, he steals one of the books and he starts asking questions about the, the why this book is talking about this subject. And uh, it's fantastic. He starts with David Copperfield, uh, Charles Dickens. Okay. And through to, uh, David Copperfield, he gets to read the Bible. He gets to read, you know, all the Homer and uh, all the great books. of. And after, at the end, he just cuts from the fireman. And uh, he goes and he lives uh, uh, with a group of people who are actual dissidents. Okay, sir. Well, in your own book, sir, you have a point that Canada is multicultural but not intercultural. Could you tell more about it? Yeah, many countries in today's world are multicultural uh, because of the migrations, but they are not intercultural because people don't care about uh, uh, culture and or civilization of the person in with whom they are working in the office or they're sharing the chair, actually the room at the university. So um, uh, actually Indians abroad, they have this problem. Yep. Uh, like Punjabis in uh, Canada. Canada. Yeah, they, are, they live in the Punjabi, uh, you know, uh, Cocoon. Brampton is the mini Punjab of Canada. Mississauga, Brampton, many places in Canada. But they, if you hang out with Punjabis, they're very Punjabi. They f eat Punjabi, they talk Punjabi, they are interested only in Punjab. Khalistanis, they believe that they have to separate Khalistan. And so they are not even interested in uh, Canadian politics. Uh, they are only interested in making money again. So um, I usually t ask my pen, and the Chinese are like that also. So these are the two big minorities of Canada. I always ask my Punjabi students, are you not interested? I mean, there are something like 30 different countries presented at this university. You're not interested to know where, what is the background of these Persians or Arabs? Or uh, some others, Koreans, no, they said, no, we are not interested. We are only interested in our own community. And that's the tragedy once again. It's not interculturality. Interculturality is based on dialogue. You have to open up to the otherness of the other. You have to ask questions from that other. Who are you? Where are you from? What are you doing? You know, like an offer, you know. Uh, the yeah, community. even if it's critical, it doesn't matter. But at least, you know, Naipaul in his books, he's very critical towards India or uh, other places where he, he went. But he asked questions. Uh, again, uh, asking questions is very important. This self-examination, it doesn't come from multiculturalism. Multiculturalism is something very artificial. It's the, like we gather here and we just pick up, uh, we call and you said we want one Iranian, one American, one Canadian, one Indian, and we just get into one room and we just look at each other. We don't ask questions and we don't even ask uh, about what we eat, you know? So uh, it's, that's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a question of uh, not being deaf and listening, asking questions and talking to the other person, you know? The, this is how we dis destroyed the indigenous people around the world. Not only North American Indians, but in the Amazon. Because people stopped asking them questions and they said, we don't care about these people, we just killed them. But th these were actually representatives of a civilization, you know, their own form of civilization. Nothing is left. Why? Because there was no interculturality. Well, so we have talked about the foreign countries, but uh, can you please express your thoughts on Indian diversity and society? And you, uh, you mean that uh, I don't consider India as a foreign country no, 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 because no. I live in <laughs> India, which is <laughs> good, which is India. good, which is good, which is actually India is not a foreign country to me, uh, though I, I really don't speak any of the lang Indian languages, but uh, I, in my heart and in my mind after more than 30 years of going back and forth and living in India and uh, having done something like um, the number of books that you said that I published uh, is doubled. So even only in India, I think I published something like 22 books. 
in the past 30 years of my life. So um, I had, I was very lucky as I was always been in my life to meet so many interesting people who some of them have passed away. Uh, this luck actually followed me in India. So I did a series for Oxford University Press which is called uh, Conversations with Eminent Indians. And really most of them who are still alive, some of them passed away, they are really eminent, not only in India, but actually in the world today, like Romila Tapper, Ashish Nandi, Sudhir Kakar, you know, Bhikkhu Parekh, uh, great people, very interesting people, all from different horizons, you know, from different backgrounds and uh, working on different subjects. I was lucky to become their friends they accepted me as their friends. They are all, all of them are, are older than I, and I've known some of them for past 30 years. So that helped me to be introduced through uh, one window, I would say, into Indian society. Then I got to know more people. I'm not saying that I appreciate all Indians. You know, I really don't like Indians with corporate mind. You know, in my university, there are lots, many of them. Uh, usually, I prefer dissidents and those who are victims. Uh, victims of, uh, of, of politics, victims of, you know, social uh, background. Minority. minority, not necessarily like Dalits and untouchables, and minorities of mind also. You know, when you're an intellectual and you're rejected by your uh, society or you're rejected by the government, which is governing you, uh, or a group of people who don't believe in a government which is governing you and they don't read your book or they don't know anything about, for example, Ashish Nandi, but if you ask them, do you know Ashish Nandi? They say, I, we don't li I don't like Ashish Nandi. Why don't you like Ashish Nandi? Have you read any book of Ashish Nandi? No, I haven't read any book. So why is it that you don't like, well, because uh, this minister tells me that, uh, or this uh, MP tells me in, in Raj Sabha or in uh, Lok Sabha that Ashish Nandi is not a good person. Again, uh, an example of confrontation. This is stupid. I mean, uh, the, the only thing that you can tell this man or woman is that you go, uh, go back home and uh, don't talk. And so go and read a little bit because <laughs> this, this is pure stupidity what you're talking about. I mean, well, how can you judge somebody when you haven't read the one page of that person who was an intellectual or great mind, you know? And we're talking about great minds uh, of uh, Indian society which are recognized all over the world, but maybe not there in their own society. So I was lucky to meet uh, next to many others from other continents, uh, these Indians, inside and outside uh, India, but mainly inside India. And I've learned a lot from them, and I continue learning from them. And uh, really, they gave me the taste of reading Indian history, uh, working more and more on different subjects, you know, uh, telling me where I was wrong, where I could have done better, uh, I'm not pretending that my books on Gandhi or Tagore and others uh, are, or Ambedkar, I've written on these three and many others. I'm not pretending that they are actually, I said the last word. Uh, there are many good historians who can correct me from time. Or they say, well, you, have, you do a lot of the work of philosophy more than a historian. I say, yes, because I just have a master's in history. You know, my work is mostly, uh, mostly a, a work of philosophy. Uh, but I, I've been learning a great deal from India. I can tell you that, let me say that this is, which is, uh, you will like that. I always say, either I was an Indian in previous life, or I will be an Indian in next life. Okay, sir. <laughs> well, last year you gave an interview to Karan Thapar, and in that you have mentioned things about new future and revolution through social media. So, what exactly it stands for you? Karan Tapper, uh, he, the, the interview that we had was mostly on what was happening in Iran, the civil resistance in Iran, and uh, mostly had to do with this marvelous new generation of Iranian women, because Iran is uh, practically 70% of the population is under the age of 35, that makes a lot of young people, and 60% of these young people are females. 
so and they are very they are brilliant because they are those who get into the universities we practically women are everywhere we have one nobel peace prize winner we have uh, poets we have filmmakers who are women now nowadays actually the uh, um, after kiarostami and others they passed away uh, now the best filmmakers of iran who won the prizes are women uh, very young women actually uh, writers are women also Political activists are women inside and outside uh, Iran. Uh, so I, I was, it's kind of a, in my interview, I was saying, well, they continue killing them, you know, when they come out and they ask not to wear the hijab, uh, they ask for more liberties, they put them in jail uh, when they are fighting for human rights and this, but I'm, I'm in admiration for with them, you know. I, uh, I find them ad admirable because they are very creative. And this creativity is a huge thing that existed actually in other parts of the world. For example, I made a comparison with May 68 in France, which changed a lot of things in French education for French feminists. Uh, it helped them to have the, the law on abortion in 1975. All that because of a new generation of uh, uh, French feminists who actually started changing. So the debate with Karan Tapper was mostly around these ideas, you know. He didn't ask me about my own work. He was asking about what I feel. He was mostly asking about the articles that I wrote in Indian Express about the civil resistance in Iran, and we talked about that. Okay, so, so you have mentioned more about nonviolence in your yesterday's speech. So, is there any roadmap for achieving institutional nonviolence? No roadmap. There is never a roadmap for nonviolence. You, you have any things in mind? Nonviolence has two sides. One is a work of conscience. You know uh, what uh, Gandhi and Thoreau and Tolstoy and Socrates they talk. They call it the inner voice. You have to listen to your inner voice, like for many other things, exactly. which we don't, you know. We, we actually, 21st century is teaching us not to listen to the inner voice and just listen to uh, the, the woman who appears on the TV journal. And, uh, but you have to listen to your inner voice, actually, because uh, as Gandhi said, it, I, I really believe in it, the truth is coming from your inner voice. Because even if you're an evil person, at night, when you're brushing your teeth and you're looking yourself in the mirror, you cannot lie to yourself. Exactly. Okay? You cannot lie. This is you. And the mirror doesn't lie. Okay? You cannot say, mirror, mirror, am I the, pre the pre prettiest or the, the best? The mirror is going to say, get lost. You are not the prettiest and you're not the best. Okay? <laughs> so it's about uh, self-consciousness. And that's, the, that's one part. Second part is a civic education. You know, if you get at the level that you say, I have to have a self-examination of myself and of the society and the world in which I'm living. So I have also to put it in practice. So I have a series of responsibilities. With the big challenges come big responsibilities, as we yeah. say, okay, in other quote. And uh, with big responsibilities, you have to put yourself into action. Uh, I, as a journalist, as a professor, uh, academic, as a doctor, as a politician, um, anything, anything you do in a society, you know, as a rickshaw drive, driver, also you have responsibilities, exactly. you know. So uh, we need to ask about our global challenges and we need to ask about our global responsibilities. Where are our challenges and where are our responsibilities? Now, uh, I have to insist on the fact that at G20, at G8, in the uh, institutions, uh, the world institutions, they don't talk about all our responsibilities. You know, politicians, one thing that they know best is to lie and not to talk about things that they should talk about, you know. One of the responsibilities that they actually talk about is very superficially is uh, the global warming. It's about the planet, you know. They organize big conferences like the Paris Conference, but nothing comes out of it. So most of the work which is done today for the safeguard of the planet, safeguard of the animals, of the plants, 
of, uh, for, on migration, on poverty. It's done by NGOs. It's done by civic actors. It's not done, they don't put one cent in the, everything is done by individuals. Look at India. All the responsibility and the responsible work which is done for the wildlife is one done for uh, education, is done for uh, sanitation, everything in the villages and outside for animals. For the uh, gulab jamun and finally thank you very much for the food. But what is left, I mean the problem is there on the table. Uh, did you touch the problem? No, we didn't touch the problem. We made some more money out of it, you know. And we had some more deals with these people. I said, we don't need Donald Trumps all over the planet. You know, we already have one and he's a big problem for us. We don't need Donald Trumps. We need Gandhis. All we need, we know about and we need people who actually are engaged themselves consciously and virtuously to change things. Well, that's a wonderful interactive session, sir. And the last question. For you, sir, you have been to MGM twice. What is your experience and your advice or message for our students? I was well, you know. I mean, MGM, like many universities in India, has needs also many changes. You know, I, I cannot say only good things about MGM um, because otherwise I will not be frank to myself okay. and to you. So. Um, in, I'm, I'm really not interested. And I'm most of the time uh, not very happy about the bureaucratic side of Indian uh, academia. You know, there's a lot of bureaucracy, there's a lot of uh, uh, this, again, corporate mindset, there's a lot of uh, arrogance, you know, it makes people. Hopefully, uh, people here uh, were not that arrogant, you know. I've seen in other universities where the vice chancellors and the chancellors and registrars. You, you can't even go and see them and say, okay, we want to do the work with you, and they don't want to, uh, I said, well, what's your task? We're just here to sit down and say, well, I'm a very happy man, and I have this, uh, look at me, how great I am as a registrar or a vice chancellor. This is not your task. Your task is to do your job properly. Exactly. Fortunately, at your university at the MGM, not because I'm here in the studio and talking to you, but uh, it looks better, much better. Uh, so, this I think is a step forward uh, toward good things. Uh, I was impressed by many of your professors, you know, because I think that uh, maybe I haven't seen all of them, but uh, some of them they have this uh, Gandhian spirit and they think they believe really in teaching and teaching something to your students and maybe making some changes in. Uh, at least in Aurangabad, or if not in India, or uh, in, uh, let's say, Maharashtra, depending uh, on what they want to do. Interaction, I think, is very important. Uh, listening is important. Uh, I was happy that, uh, at least when I give a talk, people come back with questions, and they are not there, again, just to sit down and wait for the lunch to come. You know, at you least, think. yeah, so because when people come to meetings just for the lunch, uh, I get this impression many times in India, you know, they just come, uh, for example, at India International Center in Delhi, if you organize a conference, they come for the tea and biscuits and they, 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 they leave, they don't stay for the lecture. So I always ask them, I say, are you here for the coffee and the tea and the biscuits or are you here to listen to me? Uh, it's, uh, um, but, so this uh, feeling I didn't get, you know, I, I never at MGM, at least people, they stay and they ask me questions, they quote and they say, so they have listened, that's, that's very, very important. And I think that uh, you're trying your best, including yourself, you know, you're trying to learn things, you're trying to apply it. I was very impressed by the film studies department which I went, and maybe that has to do with the fact that uh, my daughter is studying also in Canada Film Studies. So I was thinking, and this is very positive man, for you, university, I was thinking to go and tell my daughter to come and spend one month at MGM with the Film Studies. So she can learn a little bit more, and maybe she can collaborate with Indians to do a, a short movie, you know? Um, because uh, she grew up uh, actually, for, you've said it in the introduction, while we were uh, in India, 
uh, she from the age of six months to two years she actually grew up uh, with Hindi because the babysitter was a uh, Indian babysitter okay. and she barely talked Persian and but she knew uh, words uh, like Didi, Baya, you know, <laughs> the, she knew words of Hindi <laughs> so <laughs> the babysitter was called Didi so she knew a little bit and I always tell her but she forgot now uh, so I always tell her that uh, you remember I mean you actually grew up as an Indian and then you turn out to become a Canadian and in between we speak Farsi, Persian to another also. But uh, she likes uh, very much India, that which is a good uh, action. I think it's a, a good way of putting it. And uh, I like her to come and spend some time at MGM. So well, that was Professor Ramin Jahabeglosa.